While some early digital cameras faded into obscurity before they were able to leave a real mark on the industry, a special few were part of something incredible that would be able to help shape the industry in the modern world, oftentimes with very little fanfare or recognition. The Sony HDW F900 is one of those special early digital cameras that, while not perfect, helped people like George Lucas move us into the modern digital era of filmmaking with Attack of the Clones. But was this little known legend of a camera eventually abandoned by Sony? Or does it live on inside other cameras like all the Sith lived on from Darth Bane to Sidious? I am all the Sith. Find out today on our Abandoned Camera series. So, a long time ago. Got you there. The early history of Sony getting into actual video cameras is an odd story because they weren't a major player in the video world until digital cameras came along. Yet they remain one of the few companies that actually designed their own sensors. Sony is also one of the early adopters of digital cameras, getting started back 40 years ago when they tested out the world's first CCD sensor camera, the XC1. It was mounted to a jumbo jet and used to project images from the cockpit at departure and landing into the cabins, acting as the eye of the Jumbo Jet's Sky Vision system. Eventually, they would release the Sony Mavica, and then the great CCD sensor wars would begin. Now, this isn't the beginning of the story of digital sensors, and it has a long storied history, but we'll save that story for another episode. We brought the Sony uh, Discman today. Leaker has Sony camcorders, the best way to keep those family memories. Compact, lightweight, and easy to use. See all the Sony camcorders from the video pros. And while Sony had not really been focusing on making a sensor that would challenge film camera quality and appearance like Airy was just starting to really get into doing at this time, they had been working with sensors for years before anyone else in the industry had really built up any experience with them. And some companies took notice, especially Panavision. Panavision, much like Aerie and Atten, had a storied history in the film industry, starting in 1954, creating a special lens to accommodate widescreen films without costly equipment modifications. Later on developing cameras and gaining experience in large format technology, Panavision would carve out a space for itself in the industry, resulting in films including Ben-Hur and 2001 A Space Odyssey using their cameras. As the new millennium approached, they began trying to re-examine where the industry was headed and wanted to get into the digital game themselves. As they saw the perfect partner in Sony. A Sony Handycam. Will I be able to use it? Sure, Grandma, it's simple. Come on, boys. And in 1997, Panavision and Sony teamed up, with Sony bringing their long history of digital camera sensor technology and Panavision adding their vast experience making cameras and lenses for the film industry. This partnership was made to elevate the HD digital video to standards of big screen quality. And this partnership resulted in the Sony Cine Alta HDW F900, as many say, the world's first digital cinema camera. What distinguishes the HDW F900 from any contemporary camcorder at that time was its ability to capture and record digital high definition pictures at 24 progressive frames per second, just like a conventional film camera. And the reason 24 FPS was a massive feature in this camera is because Sony, like many others in the industry, were apprehensive about the market size a 24 FPS digital camera would hold. However, behind the scenes, there was another titan of the industry at work pushing for 24 frames per second in digital cameras. And he had been quietly working with Sony since 1995 to accomplish this goal. As far as I'm concerned, they should have been shooting digital cinema 20 years ago. People say, why am I doing it? Say, you know, the real question is, why not? Well, the very first time that George ever discussed his concept of a digital future for, uh, for the cinema and television was in 1989. And I'm even amazed now how precise that vision actually was. So when I went to say I'm going to do a Star Wars film, I realized that it would be much uh, better for me to actually capture the material in a digital medium. Uh, it would be much less cumbersome because it's very hard to transfer from one medium to another medium. And that's what really got me interested in trying to, to shoot a film digitally. 
Early on, Rick McCallum, a producer for George Lucas, worked with Sony to use their digital beta cam to shoot behind the scenes material during their work on movies and television. George Lucas was impressed enough with the progress they were making with digital cameras that he actually conducted some tests himself on the cameras and converting it to 35 millimeter film. When they screened it on the big screen, they had everything they wanted as far as image quality for making a movie, but it still lacked the resolution needed. So fast forward to 1996 and a dinner was arranged between the Lucasfilm team team and Sony executives. We started working with Sony to develop these cameras and try to get them to develop in 24 frame and make them compatible with what we were doing with ILM. There were certain inherent basic issues. Video was shot at 30 frames per second, film was shot at 24 frames per second, and that was a major pullback for us. After a long dinner, Sony would pledge to develop the 24 FPS system for Star Wars, but there was another issue. The next big problem that we had was, of course, not just the camera, but the lenses, the lenses that come with the camera were not acceptable to acquire this widescreen format that we shoot. So the only place I could go to then was Panavision. The actual chips that are in the camera are smaller than a 35 millimeter film image. That meant the performance of the lens actually had to be better than a 35 millimeter lens since you were using a, a smaller area to image the entire high resolution frame on. Both Panavision and Sony knew that Lucas wanted to film with digital for The Phantom Menace, but they would be unable to meet that deadline. So they pushed forward, trying to get it ready in time for the second Star Wars installment. We wanted to shoot the last film this way and uh, had been working with Sony for several years to try to make it happen um, and just couldn't get the cameras built fast enough. The development got started back in 1997 and would last through 2000, with Sony working on the camera, Panavision working on the lenses, and Sony also partnering with Laser Pacific, who helped with the post-processing system for 24p footage. On this show, we, uh, we've got to plug seven cables into the camera. An HD, a time code, a genlock, two audios, and data. Well, yes, this is uh, the day shooting. There's no more laboratory, it's now on tape. Uh, sound and picture on the same recording device, sunk automatically for us to uh, put in on the computers, it's all on this one thing. And on March 10th, 2000, a screening was held at the Skywalker Ranch with the final tests of the prototype HDW F900. After a discussion following the screening, George Lucas felt confident enough to pull the trigger on the cameras and said, let's do it. By the time we got it finished and we got all the deals together, it was just like, two weeks before I was going to shoot Phantom Menace. We were able to later on get a prototype camera with a prototype lens and shoot a couple of scenes and bits of scenes digitally, which I wanted to do because I wanted to see how well it matched into the film that we'd shot. Uh, and it matched in so well nobody ever noticed it. But that meant that I knew now that I had the cameras, I had the lenses, and I could shoot the next film uh, completely digitally and I wouldn't have to move back and forth between mediums. Sony would make six prototype F-900s for George Lucas and Star Wars Attack of the Clones, but there were issues including having to go back and re-record all of the dialogue for the entire movie due to issues with the camera. They also had to contend with how to store all of the footage, but even with that, it was still much simpler than film. After the release of the movie, which though it never received much acclaim as a cinematic masterpiece, it still pushed the industry forward technically, with many now seeing the work Lucas, Sony, Panavision, and many others had achieved in the digital space, which led to a slowly growing appetite for digital cinema cameras going forward, resulting in companies like RED getting into the game a few years later. But why was this historic camera eventually abandoned? And while this camera would go on to help film over 65 films and TV shows including Doctor Who and Dexter, and other well-known features, it really was never intended to be a camera that would be used forever or as a main camera. Eventually, with companies like Red, Airy, and even Panavision and Sony hopping into the digital space even more, creating lighter and easier to control systems, and the use of this camera began to decline, especially in the movie industry, though it is still credited for helping film some lesser-known movies as late as 2013. But its high cost and quickly aging specifications would eventually lead to it being discontinued. This camera was always designed to really just be a beta camera for Sony, much like that of the Aeriflex D20 and D21 from Airy. And from this experimental camera that was so instrumental in the rise of digital cinema cameras, Sony and Panavision were able to build their next camera on the backbone of the work they had done here, the Panavision Genesis and the Sony F35, which stories you can hear by clicking the link above, or check out our entire series of the abandoned camera series in the link above as well.